Welcome to the CEO Telecom Exchange Roundtables, both for our guests here at Telecom Exchange LA, welcome, as well as for our viewers joining us as we stream on Facebook and on JSA TV. Our third panel today is on the very hot topic of smart machines. We're talking connected cars, robots, and the necessary infrastructure. And I'm very honored to introduce uh, Mr. Jeremy Kaplan. He's the Editor-in-Chief of Digital Trends, or DT. If you're not familiar, it's a leading consumer publication that reaches about 25 million readers a month. So many of us in this room, I'm sure. As Editor-in-Chief, Jeremy oversees a staff of 35 editors, video producers, and content experts, as well as dozens of contributors, providing up to 100 pieces of news analysis and product reviews each day that spans all areas of tech. We're talking, of course, including smart machines. So uh, quite a lot of writing <laughs> and reading, I'm sure. So thank you, Jeremy, for taking time out of your day and, and for being here, joining us. Um, and thank you, everyone, for, uh, for listening. Jeremy? Jamie said she's going to embarrass me. It's the mister that embarrasses me more than anything else. <laughs> So yeah, Digital Trends, and for those of you who don't know, we're a technology news and review site, 25 million to 30 million users uh, per month. Um, and we focus on technology for the way you live, which increasingly is growing more complex as everything gets connected. And that's not just your smartphone, your smartwatch, but your stove and your fridge and whatnot. Um, and I think that the challenge that we're all facing, we've all been seeing in the industry, is that increasingly while these things connect, they also don't talk to each other very effectively. So I have a smartwatch, and it doesn't talk to my smartphone which is like the most basic thing, and yet it's the truth. And last year, I bought a dishwasher, which is really neat. It's got this companion app, and you hold the app up, and it plays a little sound, and it goes online and diagnoses problems with the dishwasher, and it doesn't talk to anything else. I bought a new fridge. It doesn't talk to it. I bought a new stove. I bought all new appliances. They don't talk to each other. And I, of all people, I would think would have the things that speak to each other correctly. No, this is increasingly a problem. So we have here a panel of experts to talk about some of the infrastructure challenges we're facing. And it's a neat gamut. Uh, they, they run the gamut between the people that are building the infrastructure to the people that are building the, the, the protocols that run on the infrastructure, to people that are using the infrastructure, to people that can talk about what it all means for us. So uh, I tend to introduce people with the wrong names. I call everyone Billy Bob when that's not really their name. Maybe you guys could each introduce yourselves and tell us just really briefly what your company does and how it relates to this space. I guess I'll start. Uh, I'm Doug Junkins. I'm from NTT, uh, specifically uh, part of NTT's applied R&D organization in uh, Silicon Valley that's looking at technology that's emerging in the market and how NTT as an infrastructure provider can leverage that technology to improve the services and, and uh, product offerings to our enterprise customers. Uh, hi, my name is Arthur Lazinski. I'm the CEO of Umnitsa. Umnitsa is an IoT platform. We originally started tracking things that are more traditional, such things as mobile devices, servers, switches, and are now tracking a number of IoT devices. And maybe today we can talk about the similarities and why that's, uh, why that's possible. Hey guys, uh, my name is Elter. I'm the CTO of Skirt, and uh, at Skirt we are trying to make mobility more accessible to everyone. And which we do this by trying to increase the utilization rate of a car. So we are a mobility company. Right now, you, you, we let you like book a car from your mo from a mobile application, and we deliver the car to you. And on the background, we are building the infrastructure to move these cars around the city, being able to deliver them. So like the physical infrastructure, as well as doing being able to do all these calculations to increase the average utilization rate of every car in our platform and basically trying to make one car more accessible by multiple people throughout the day or throughout the month. Um, I'm Frank Toby. I actually have two hats. One is that I have a website called The Robot Report, which tracks the business of robotics. And the other is that I'm a co-founder of a company called Robo Global that produces an index of robotic stocks that is I've been licensed by a variety of 
exchange traded funds that operate around the world so that people can invest in the robotic schema. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, so let's start off by talking about a topic that some of our earlier panels touched upon. Am I too loud? I get, no. I get loud and I get passionate when I talk. <clears throat> Just wave at me if I'm talking too loudly. Anyway, um, Jamie mentioned in her initial opening remarks the concept of smart networking. So we have smartphones, we have smart watches, and smart cars, and smart homes, and we have smart lives. The, smart, the, the network itself needs to evolve to deal with this. So Doug, maybe, uh, maybe I'll throw this at you first. To what extent has the network evolved to date? And to what extent do you think it'll need to change to deal with the growing number of things that are online? I think that the network, uh, I, I've been building the internet myself since 1995 <laughs> with the one ISP or another growing. It, the network has, has always been evolving to um, find new ways to deliver services to, to, to customers to meet new demands. I think with the technology that's being developed now um, around software-defined networking and, and software-defined wide area networking, the the capability for the network to adapt to changing workloads on its own in, in an autonomous fashion is, is actually very close to being a reality for us. Some people are already starting to look at network traffic patterns based on you know, evolving use cases and being able to adapt their network to topology or, or architecture in order to be able to better serve that, that particular application. I think as we, as we continue to evolve um, to this world where every device is connected, there are going to be patterns that start to emerge in terms of what's talking to each other. You, you've, you spoke about appliances. Maybe there needs to be um, you know, a, a network of, of dishwashers um, that are communicating use cases or, or failure patterns. Um, in a way that's different than your, how your refrigerators talk. Uh, you know, I don't want to start to build silos or walls between the appliances. You know, there's one, you know, all appliances matter. So, <laughs> um, but in any case, uh, you know, I, th the network is going to need to learn those, those patterns through observation and then adapt um, to, to meet those patterns. And we're starting to see the technology to do that now. Um, when we're able to set up ad hoc networks um, between particular devices based on their, their communication patterns. Yeah, I think to maybe just follow up on that, one of the things that we're seeing is that I think that a lot of that infrastructure technology is following the actual use cases we're trying to accomplish. So I think as we're trying to accomplish more use cases, that infrastructure is going there. Trying to put the cart before the horse and coming up with all the ways we can improve infrastructure I think is good, but at the end of the day, we're trying to solve a problem. And if we're really trying to solve that problem, we need the right infrastructure. And so I think the infrastructure players are catering to the problems we're trying to solve. Uh, I think infrastructure and I think wires, um, but do we, do we have the right type of infrastructure at present? Is, is there is a change to the, to the protocols that we need or is, there, is everything just going to work over Wi-Fi or over Ethernet or whatever we happen to have? Anyone? I, I think um, the world we live in today is everything, everything is IP. Um, the transport of how that IP is connected shouldn't matter. Um, what, we, what we're seeing now is um, the way that we're adapting networks is we're building overlay networks on top of an IP infrastructure so that that transport of the, of the underlying IP can be you know, ubiquitous across whatever transport technology you need in order to connect to a device. The networking we're talking about that's going to be adaptable on top of that is being built as you know, an overlay that's abstracted from that transport. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot more work to be done. I think especially when we're talking about smart manufacturing, we're talking about stadiums, we're talking about a lot of capacity, a lot of data. I know VRs, uh, you know, videos taking into consideration all this other stuff. But uh, just based on our past trends, I, I think we're going to solve that problem. You know, and I think uh, the more demand there is, the easier, you know, over time we're going to solve that problem. Because there's a lot of money to be made in solving that issue for all the other things that are built on top and then provide all that value to the end customer. Uh, that very, very low layer has to be there and I think we'll continue to be there. Uh, Frank, we were talking about this before, um, um, and Doug mentioned the uh, all appliances matter, um, but communication between different devices is one of the real challenges. Um, what, what, can you share that anecdote we were discussing before? 
FANUC is a large robot manufacturer. They have 400,000 robots around the world that are at work. They did a study with IBM to see how they could maintain their equipment better. And they found that if they took the streaming data from every robot and just analyzed it compared to all the others, they could find patterns of when the equipment was, or screws, or washers, or devices were going to break down. And they could then schedule a, a maintenance application. The problem is that those 400,000 robots, which have perhaps another 10 sensors streaming, so 4 million streaming devices, are in perhaps 4,000 companies, each with their own security system. And they don't want to give their data or allow their data to be analyzed, even though it's beneficial for everybody involved. Not only that, they don't exactly speak the same computer language. FANUC sends all their data to Rockwell. Rockwell has a proprietary uh, system that does not speak to anybody else. And if you have a company that has a Rockwell system and you want to send that data somewhere, um, wh who's to say it's secure or not secure? Um, and that's the problem that they're having. Here they found that they could improve efficiency, productivity, and runtime to the IBM standard of 99.99. .99. And they can't do it, because they can't get permissions from all the different players that are involved. And I think like when we're talking about IoT, and we're talking about industrial internet and all this stuff, what's really happening is these manufacturers, the Rockwells of the world, KUKAs of the world, they're thinking in one way, which is proprietary. This belongs to us. We built it, our standards. We integrate with our own systems. We don't integrate with other people because security, because uh, product quality, all this stuff. And then you got the entire other side, which is software guys. And software guys are like, hey, no, go ahead and use it. Open APIs, documentation, everybody work together. I mean, that's where the open source came from. That's where all our software's in. And what's happening is these manufacturers are now getting pressed to say, hey, you need to have the software compatibility. And the software guys are going, wait a minute, what do you mean I can't install Windows 10 on everything? And so now what's happening is these standards that we used to have and these new guys, they're coming together and two worlds are colliding. And so you have people who are in the manufacturing business going, why in the world would I open my APIs? And you got guys on the software area going, if you don't open these APIs, you will die. And so now I think what's happening is we're, we're going to find common middle ground and we're just in the beginning of that. And I think that's why this space is so interesting. I think it's partially because like doing these hardware things are becoming easier now, like manufacturing things. I can design something on my own, send it to someone in China, and like they start manufacturing this like unit for me. So as software people, I think oftentimes like recently, especially I find myself like trying to design some like hardware unit, and it's much easier to manufacture now. So I feel like these big guys are becoming more kind of like influenced to do it or like forced to switch to more open model. I think it's like a trend in a lot of industries that like over time they they have to open up and I think they're slowly realizing it. But it, yeah, I, th I think though, I mean, the reality is these these large um, established companies, um, giants or, or dinosaurs, maybe you might might want to call them, they're they're not going to move overnight to being open. They're, they're, it's just not the way that their um, their program is not the way that they've evolved to be successful. So what we can do as infrastructure providers is start to give them a path to, to how to open up by addressing some of their concerns, giving them a network, for example, where they can connect their, their devices outside of you know a factory manufacturing network, a closed network, so that we can actually start to collect those devices in a way that, that are secure, but they don't have to to be completely open. We can create an overlay network that only ties their devices together into one of their analysis systems that, that they might provide as a service with, without, again, trying to make them you know, 
completely pull back the, the bed sheets and, and expose everything that they, uh, that they have developed or have available. And they won't do that anyway. I think it's it's about coming to that middle ground. You know, I think you you mentioned uh, uh, Rockwell, and I think you think of all these like Johnson Controls. You mentioned them earlier. Uh, Honeywell. You think of all these companies that have been around for so long, and everything is built built around proprietary Siemens. And so I think eventually they're going to have to find that middle ground. I think companies like NTT and a lot of other companies are helping that happen, but it's, uh, I think this, there's going to be a completely new type of person that we haven't seen before, which is somebody that really understands manufacturing, which in its own right is, is you know, is so many layers, and then somebody who also understands software and technology and combining the two. And I think that's when we're going to see manufacturing automation to the next level. Um, but it's so early. You talk to a manufacturing guy about technology and talk to a tech guy about manufacturing, they have no idea. And finding the guys that live in that middle, I, there's probably a handful at most. And that's going to change. So, uh, so Arthur, you know, we were talking about this earlier. Um, I was making the example of my dishwasher, which doesn't really talk to anything. Uh, and you made a great point that there are companies that are adding networking and Ethernet ports onto old devices. And those aren't really thought from the ground up as being smart devices. And then you have something like an Amazon uh, Alexa, the Google Home devices. These things planned from the ground up for interoperability and for networking, which really transforms the, uh, the, the entire space, right? Yeah, I think uh, the retrofitted devices, you know, the, the fr refrigerators, the robots, all these things we're trying to make smart have these limitations. And these new things, like you mentioned, like the Amazon Echo or these other things, just the way we interact with them is completely different. I don't need to use my phone to interact with the Amazon Echo, right? Like, I've just talked to it. So imagine, you know, now when this microphone becomes smart or the building becomes smart, I can interface with that building through whatever's already built into it. I can't go and talk to my refrigerator, right? Like, that seems crazy right now. But when the refrigerator's built, ground up with a microphone and it has a chips in it and all these other stuff that it needs, the very first thing I'm going to do is go to it and say, hey, order more eggs. And it's going to go order more eggs. But we can't do that with the retrofitted stuff, obviously, because of the limitations that they provide. Why, why would your refrigerator not know to order more eggs when you're low on eggs, though? It should if it has some <laughs> kind of weight or it's doing some kind of visual stuff. Right. My, our co-founder, Trent Seed, and I, we, uh, we like to you know, talk about all this kind of other stuff we could do as if you know, we weren't fully comp you know, on one company. Uh, so we, we like to pretend we have free time. And one of the things we like to pretend is what would it look like to have the best connected fridge? Um, Trent, who's just a genius, came up with this idea of having weight. What if you put your eggs into the same spot every day, and then, you know, overweight, you can tell? Turns out eggs weigh different, weigh, it's just a little more complicated <laughs> than we originally thought. But yes, that's what's going to happen. Automatic supply chain, reordering things based on quantity in your own home. It's definitely going to happen. So the concept of sharing information is, is vital in a lot of different ways. And it, it means different things for business versus consumer appliances. So for example, the concept of my, uh, my furnace talking back to the network and saying, uh, I need maintenance. Well, that's fantastic. Who wouldn't like that? Um, but it does raise some privacy concerns, doesn't it? And as you talk about devices like, like the Echo, you're, uh, and more consumer devices where you have more personal information, I think you're more likely to wade into the privacy debate. Um, Ilter, wh wh what sort of information does your company send back to the network? How do, you, how do you monitor privacy like that? How do you worry about that? I mean, one thing we're looking at is these, like, getting, like, for example, diagnostics data from cars. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting case with cars, I think, because they have these things called like OBD boards, which are actually standardized protocols, and they are pr fairly open right now. I was just thinking about why, and I realized that because these devices need more maintenance, and like, for example, like BMW can't have mechanics shops around the city, so they had to, I guess, like expose some of these things already. So yeah, one thing we do is like we, we can use this open protocol to get all the diagnostics data from the car, their fuel level, if it needs oil change and all this stuff, and uh, we can store it in our own database. And uh, that way we know that when a car needs maintenance, uh, we work with other partners to get these cars actually, so we can tell our partners that these cars need maintenance or service checkup, all these things. So it's, it's interesting. The, the OBD2 connector is, is a great example of taking something that's old school and giving it uh, the, this mass kind of appeal. Since 2004, I believe, you probably know this yeah. better, it's, it's required that all cars after 2000 have OBD2 connector. And you can go and buy an OBD2 connector, plug it into your car, and get data onto your mobile device, as most likely everybody knows. But what's most interesting is all these cameras, all this OBD2 stuff started going into other stuff, like your tractors, like 
your other favorite, like uh, I think coffee machines run on a CAN bus, right? So like all this stuff is, um, is becoming standardized. How do we get more of that to happen in other industries outside of the car industry where yes, you're right, uptime and efficiency and diagnostics are so important? I will need another panel for that. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I, you know, I, I think um, that, that that's a big problem to solve when you when you're trying to figure out how to do the networking within these smart devices, and then what the interface is. Where where is that boundary between the network that's that's running the device, the CAN bus in a car, for example, and the um, you know the external network? How you how you're connecting to that device. And in CAN bus, I mean, obviously brings up all kinds of security concerns because it's it's a completely unsecure device in your network or in in your automobile, and um, you know we, there have been remote hacks shown where if you can get access to that that bus through I, I think the the easiest one that people have shown through um, entertainment systems that are connected, you can actually you know disrupt the whole operation of the car, so. Figuring out where that where that boundary from the external network to the internal network of these devices are, and how to secure that boundary is something that needs to be solved before you're going to start to see, you know, any sort of ubiquitous standard for those internal devices. So <clears throat> now's a good time to tell the story of George Hotz. Uh, <laughs> um, George Hotz is a hacker, and he. He was the first guy to hack an Apple uh, iPhone. But in the uh, self-driving arena, he wrote 2,000 lines of code that he put into, along with physical hacks, and uh, he put into Uber cars in San Francisco, 10 Uber cars. And all of them had uh, radar and a few other cameras. He then took the data from three months of 10 cars operation and ran it through his 2,000 lines of code, which wrote on its own new code that drove a car. He took a Bloomberg reporter out with him, and they drove in the streets of San Francisco and on the freeway. and. At one point, the car swerved out of the way of a bicyclist, and the Bloomberg reporter said, well, you programmed for that, right? He says, there's not a word of code that I programmed in this. It's coded by itself. There's 3,000 people doing the same task at Google. So the hacking aspect of this and also the evolutionary aspect of this and the speed and the exponentiality is something that I don't have a clue where, how fast it's going and where it's going, but I can see it happening. Well, we have a couple people on this panel that have some direct insight. Uh, gentlemen, how soon are we going to get the self-driving cars? Uh, Joe Hart is actually my friend. <laughs> uh, we went to the same college. And I, I think like in six, seven years, it's realistically going to be everywhere in California. Uh, not obviously the whole world, but I, I actually think in six years, a whole cal like, actually all cars will be autonomous, especially like around the areas where we live right now. Yeah. And the interesting thing with this is like there's no transition between like a normal car and, and autonomous cars. At some point, I think all the cars needs to be autonomous because mixing them is even actually like the most more challenging than like building these autonomous cars. So I. I I'm guessing there will be a f short phase where like there will be a one lane dedicated to autonomous cars, but like eventually I think like all of our roads will be dedicated to autonomous cars. If you want to drive yourself, if you like driving, you just go to a race racing track or something and drive your car. But like all the cars, like I think in a fairly short future it will be autonomous. I think like specifically with this election and all this, I see how quickly things can change, and I think things can change really quickly. Even things that have so much legislation like. Our road. So I think it's, it's completely realistic. But back to the security thing for just one second. I think what's so interesting about security, and especially with all these connected devices that people are missing from a tech side, is that if you think about endpoints, as they call it, these endpoints that connect to the internet, whether they're your mobile device, whether they're Visa POS systems at Target, whatever they are, they are all have the same issue. They're all connected to the internet. So uh, if we think that we're going to solve that problem, 
or we already have solved that problem, it's incorrect. Ask anybody that works in IT at any corporation in the world and ask them if we've solved the endpoint security problem. The problem is going to magnify as we have more cars, and it'll be a cat and mouse race. There will always be dangers of this stuff. The CAN bus, the, the robots, the cars, and your mobile device, they're always vulnerable to these hacks. And I think the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is the right infrastructure for that? But I think our fear and, and, our, um, and those concerns should not hinder innovation. And I think that's really important, is I think we need to move, continue moving forward with these endpoints and find better ways to secure them. Yeah, and the, the, the idea of having all of these endpoints that you have to secure and, and manage and everything, that brings into you know, the, the evolution of the management systems for managing end devices. Today, you know, there may be some MDM type solutions that you use on your phones and your laptops, but it's not, it's not evolved to the point where we can actually manage what software version, what patch level, what security parameters are set on millions and billions of devices that are being connected to the internet. So one of the things that, that really needs to be worked on is how it is that you understand what assets there are out there in the, in the network, how they're being managed, what, what um, versions there are for it, and how they're being secured. Until we can centralize that, um, we're going to live in a world where, where these sort of hacks are, I, I didn't want this to turn, or I didn't mean for this to turn into a security panel, but um, you know, the, the reality is that's, that's where we need to be in order to be able to make the next step to this, this world of, of devices that are connected and communicating themselves. And, and, and just to add one thing, I just want to drive this point home. It's not actually a technology issue. It's not actually something that is a technology is going to solve. It's a process human issue. So when we think about managing endpoints today, the reason that we have such security discrepancies is because we can't answer simple questions like, where is the device? How crazy is that? That the IT teams all across the world don't know where their laptops is. I'm sure that anybody here has worked at a big company and walked away with a laptop. Guarantee it. Or something that the and that's the security risk. You can upgrade all your firewalls all you want. You can invest into all the security software in the world. If you don't have hygiene inside your company or even at home, based on how you manage your things end to end, no software or tool or agent you can install on the device is going to do you any good. It's about hygiene, it's about process, and that's the most unsexy thing about IoT, but it's so true. And it's really important. But the challenge is that consumers don't want to give any bits of data up, and we need to pump out an incredible amount of data. Consumers are worried about the Alexa phoning back that the lights are out, because then therefore I'm asleep, and so somebody might come in and, and grab me in my bed or something. But meanwhile, we need to know detailed information about how long the lights were on, and which switch was on, and, and uptime, and all that stuff. Um, I, I, what, what, that's the security issue. That's the real risk. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. We're in violent agreement. <laughs> <laughs> um, another topic I wanted to bring up here, because we, the very important stuff, um, speaking about Alexa, which is a fascinating way to control your devices. Um, we have this, this world of bots coming out these days that are, that are doing, that are controlling our devices and are chattering back and forth with each other um, and, and creating this vast amount of background network traffic. Um, is this a security concern? Is this something we should worry about? Um, and from an infrastructure perspective, is there anything we need to do to support this, to think about data prioritization? Sure, I'll start again. <laughs> a big chunk um, to throw at you. I, I think that um, you know, from from a security perspective, I, I think that it's it is data that's going to have to be um, made visible if we want to um, be able to really adapt to to this world of connected devices. So I think we've pretty well beat that home. Um, in in terms of um, looking at the network infrastructure as it exists today. I think the, the, the way the, the internet has evolved over the last, let's say, 10 years has been this massive consolidation of resources into large data centers where everything is getting centralized um, into you know, extremely large um, pools of, of compute resources. As I, I think it was Mark on the first panel mentioned, that world doesn't really adapt well to 
a, a IoT world of, of connected devices where we need to actually start to learn how to distribute those compute resources out as close to those devices as possible so we can collect and, and consolidate and correlate data um, near the edges or else it will inundate the, the network. Um, as well as you know, making sure that we have the ability to have very low latency access to some of those compute resources. So when you don't have enough um, compute power on your mobile device or your, in your refrigerator to you know, determine what the pattern for ordering eggs is, you know, today's Tuesday, so they're not going to have eggs tomorrow. We want to wait till Wednesday to order them, for example. You know, those, those sorts of, of learning algorithms and, and uh, artificial intelligence the refrigerator may not be capable of making those decisions itself. Um, maybe latency for that particular application doesn't matter, and you could do it in, in um, you know, a data center in Singapore if that's where your compute, compute resources are. But there are going to be applications where you need to have an instantaneous sort of response to a question from a device. And you, being able to distribute those, those algorithms out towards the edges is going to become very important. Uh, especially for use cases that we aren't even necessarily dreaming of yet. So um, I think that's, that's the important shift we're going to see from an infrastructure perspective and a network perspective is the, the dis distribution of all of this uh, compute power that we've now spent 10 years consolidating. Yeah, it's a, it's a concept of load balancing. It seems like, you know, and where do you where do you balance the load? I have a buddy of mine who runs a speech recognition, it's like a Siri uh, competitor, and what they do is they put it into little toys for kids, and you can interact with the toys. And of course, the toys aren't going to be connected to the internet because they have to work whenever, and so this interaction has to happen on the chipset on the device, and their biggest cost is that chip that they have to run on the device. So when we talk about edge computing, it's basically, you know, are we running that information on the device and how much of it are we running? And I wonder how much of that question is the application provider versus the actual infrastructure, and does the application provider have the necessary tools to provide the best end service to the end customer? Yeah, I think privacy is another issue that is actually very related and it's, it's going to be solved with these, like, having these computations happening on the client side. Like, Apple started to do this thing where, like, they can actually, they have this thing called differential learning. So like they can do a lot of the, the AI or the machine learning stuff on the phone, or even if they need to go back to the data center, they kind of like anonymize your data and send it, and then it comes back. So like, for example, in my case, I'm fairly open-minded about all these technologies and stuff. But like, having Alexa at my house still makes me uncomfortable. It's like some device listening to my conversations, and it goes back to Amazon's data centers. But if I knew that the device was actually just keeping the all those like listening the, the sounds it collects in, in the device, in the client, I would be a lot more comfortable. I think that's something that is going to be kind of required for privacy as well, because otherwise like, uh, it's going to get really uncomfortable for people. Well, we've got, uh, uh, did you want to jump in? Well, I was just going to say that once 5G comes along and can really speed up the latency factor, um, we hope. But that can change a lot. Because right now, like your toy example, the, the chips provide as much as you can possibly get locally. But when you have a mobile robot and you're carrying power around, you're limited really on what you can do. And right now, going to the cloud is totally inefficient. And I think the drone example, the military drone example, those drones fly by themselves except for the first two minutes of takeoff and the last two minutes of landing. That's done by uh, on the ground remote control. Uh, uh, we've got a matter of minutes left. If anybody has any questions for our panelists, this would be a good time to throw it out there. What about the implications potential implications with the FTC and the FCC. Are you guys concerned about that at all? Uh, we're not because we're a B2B business and as far as we're concerned, if the customer is willing to give us money for it, you know, we're, we're willing, to, willing to give them our product. Um, uh, I wonder how much that legislator affects you guys specifically. No. Are, are you guys affected by any of that legislature? Not really. No. We're in the same. Well, I mean, this is 
labeled as a telecom exchange, so that's why I'm asking more from a telecom perspective. Right. Maybe not necessarily from the data perspective. Yeah, so, you know, as the, the telecom representative up here on this panel, um, obviously NTT looks very closely at what legislature is, or what the FTC and FCC are doing as well as other legislative bodies around the world to make sure that, you know, the, the services that we're offering fit into um, whatever that, um, those regulations are. Um, and even, you know, to the point of having uh, people in, in Washington to help um, work with the FCC and, and other uh, governmental agencies to make sure that, that regulations that are coming out are, um, you know, technically feasible as well as commercially feasible. So I think it's, I, I don't think that anything that is taking place in terms of the evolution of the network is is outside of, of what the FCC is has purview over, but I don't think anything is is massively different than the way that we've, um, you know, handled the, the growth of the internet for the last 20 years either. Did, did that answer your question? Not really. No. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a better answer for you then. <laughs> that was very fair. <laughs> uh, any other questions for our panelists? Not just. I'll make a comment rather than the question is going. I, I serve on <coughs> Beverly Hills uh, has decided that autonomous vehicles are, are imminent, are disruptive, are going to change all of our land use and urban planning, and so we've been studying them for, for a year. Um, the comments about how imminent, um, it's going to be driven by safety, okay? Now, for the first time in many years, the fatalities on U.S. roads are increasing. But where you need to pay attention to is Southeast Asia. I think half a million people die a year on roads in China. And so this is a technology issue. So autonomous vehicles will exist in Southeast Asia. They will exist in China. And it's the same cars, it's the same connectors. And uh, you mentioned George Hotz. Uh, you know, for Comma AI, for 200 bucks, you know, you were very close to being able to put a device into your Audi that was better than a Tesla. It was, you know, I mean, he took it off the market because NHTSA went after him a little bit. But you know, autonomous vehicles will be here. They'll be driven by safety, and you'll be able to you'll be able to put them in your cars. Where I disagree with you a little bit is there are so many cars around. I don't know how we deal with the interaction of autonomous vehicles and, and human-driven vehicles on the road, and it's it's a real dilemma. I think what you'll find in Southern California is that the uh, HOV lanes will be AB only. Mm -hmm. Okay, and interesting things happen. I mean, I've run through numbers. I get 20x capacity. I put an autonomous vehicle lane only 20 times capacity. Um, others will argue for 10, but all of a sudden you've increased the capacity of an infrastructure we already have. So ABs might only be on highways, okay? They might be replacing chains, but I, you know, so I, I agree with your analysis. I think they're going to be much more imminent than, than anybody thinks. Um, That's great news for LA. <laughs> it, it is, and you know, the safety issue is an interesting one. Uh, you know, the the the, fe the federal standard is if it's twice as safe, we'll look at it. Okay, so if we're only killing 15,000 people a year, that's 15,000 lives saved. How do we deal with the one or two? Because everybody will go robot, just kill somebody, right? <laughs> you know, as soon as something goes wrong. Um, you know, the dilemma here might slow things down. I, I would pay attention to China in particular. Um, we've interviewed just about every major automobile manufacturer we can. We're singularly impressed with Volvo, and Volvo is a Chinese company. Um, pay attention to China. Just an opinion. <laughs> I'll offer you the opposite opinion. Yep. <laughs> We've had the ability to have self-driving airplanes for what? 25 years? Self-driving trains for what? 35 years? We still don't have it. But you don't have the safety factor to, to, to driving it. It, it. It's the safety factor that is going to drive. I, I, I think it's going to drive autonomous vehicles. It only takes one train accident to get everybody's attention. Well, I think if you go to Palo Alto, California, Mountain View, California, you're going to see just as many self-driving cars as you're going to see normal cars. And I think that's maybe just to that region, but those aren't going anywhere. Well, and I'll also point out that the car industry, the industry that successfully killed electric cars the first time around, wiped out trams and public transport in California also. This is one hell of an industry. And you're thinking five years you're going to be able to cut? No. That's 
this industry is a lot. I mean, you're also not you looking at very, very hard. commercially flying a plane, like having a pilot there doesn't really cost that much. Like the flight takes 12 hours, you pay the pilot for a day. It doesn't really like also commercially, it, it, there's not like business incense, incentive to replace that pilot with someone, but like there are <laughs> billions of cars right now. And then like actually the times that people will say by not having those drivers is huge compared to like times people say it by not having pilots. I take your analogy, every autonomous vehicle has to have a qualified driver. No, it won't have to. No, no, no. Not the level fives. Yeah. I, th I think it's a, it's a matter of discussion that in five years we just, will be a new discussion. So I think we'll, we'll wait and see. I, for one, will buy a self-driving car as soon as it's available because I, I have work to do and I can't be driving. If I, if I just had a comment, there's a reason, at least for my city, the reason we don't care whether it's five years or 20 years is because we go look at the impact of autonomous vehicles. So, so let's say it's 20 years. If anybody thinks it's not going to be in 20 years, I think you're completely wrong. I, I think it's the time frame. We build buildings for 100 years. We build streets for 100 years. So our, our urban and land use planning has to change now. You know, uh, Parking for any significant size residential building is 40% of the cost of the building. Okay, If you could remove 40% of the cost of the building because you don't need to park cars anymore, that's a whole change, a whole change in land use. And, and so, um, yes, we need to worry about the time frames, but we need to do our planning now. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a very, very unique approach. And, and, and your, your, your business, every single manufacturer we've talked to does not believe they can sell cars for very long. Okay. Yeah, the ownership will die too. Like, oh, I think there will be fleets of cars in the future owned by these OEMs themselves. Yeah. Cars spend 85 or 90 percent of the time in the garage. Somebody's going to come along, and as you get home, they're going to say, "If you give me your car, I'll pay 50 percent of your car." That, that's filter. That's his business. Yeah, and as you get to work, they're going to do it. So, you know, you're not going to buy cars anymore. Um, your, your model, I think. And, and on that note, we have to wrap up here. Uh, I'll put a round of applause for my panelists.